Welcome back to the Educational Diagnostician Series. Um, in today's installment, we're going to look at choosing different assessment tools, kind of how you think about um, what you want to give, um, what you need to give, and um, how you deal with different data sets when they come in, especially when they don't match up. So our agenda today, we're going to start with just looking at those different areas of assessment um, that are required for different disability areas. And then we're going to talk about choosing assessment tools, both the base tools that we tend to use, and then digging deeper with any follow-up tools that are needed. And then finally, we'll look at those contradictions in data and how to um, account for those, how to write them up, um, but how to make sense of them and, and own that data and see what those kinds of differences and trends might mean. So the different areas of assessment um, that are required for a disability area um, are specified on the permission forms that we generate in the Indiana IEP system. So the system is kind of good as far as um, it protects us from missing something for our initial evaluations. So some of you may have had quite a bit of experience with generating those permission forms. Um, others may have only seen the forms after they've been generated. Um, but with the initial evaluations, where you identify what uh, disability area is suspected based on the data that you have, it will automatically check all of the required areas by Article 7 on the permission form and it does not allow you to uncheck them. And that's a good thing. It forces us to make sure that we've got everything covered, at least on the permission. Now it's really up to you to make sure that all of those things get completed and get, make their way into the educational evaluation report. Reevaluations are a little bit different because you can actually remove some areas that you may not need. If you don't need data, then you, you certainly don't need, to, um, you don't need to assess something just because it was checked on the form initially. You can uncheck those things when you determine exactly what is needed to answer the questions that you have. It is important though to make sure that all areas for a new eligibility area when you do a reevaluation are included so that you don't inadvertently uncheck something that you think well I really don't need that but it was required and you didn't already have that kind of data so it, it's important to make sure that um, we we really keep all of those things in mind as we're completing the forms and we're being very thoughtful about what we check and what we uncheck it tells us the areas of assessment, but the specific tools that are identified as part of the evaluation um, are chosen by the MT members. The expectation is that you all have the expertise, you have the professional background to determine what specific tests should be used in order to answer the questions that you have. I think sometimes this comes up as a, a challenge um, when a parent might request a specific assessment, a specific test, and, and that's really up to the multidisciplinary team to make that call. On the screen you'll see a document that identifies all of the different eligibility areas and all of the areas of assessment that are required for each of those. So if you kind of start at the bottom of the form, you can see that we have certain things that have to be um, assessed for any disability area. Now one is identified as that any other assessments as needed, and that is the one thing that you can always uncheck, even on initials, because it's just kind of that blanket category to say, you know, we may need some additional information um, in order to answer those questions. So you can choose to leave that on your permission forms or you can remove that if you like. Um, it's also important that we see that social and developmental history is required for every disability area. We've got to have background knowledge 
about the, the child's development, some of those um, things that are going on at home and things that kind of factor into um, interpreting the data that we, we get through the evaluation. Academic assessment is another area that is included for most disability areas. The only area that it is not required for is developmentally delayed. And I would kind of caution you to think about adding it for a lot of our, our students. Now that the age range for developmentally delayed has been extended, we have a lot of students that might be considered for this category that are already in school. And although an academic area is not one that can be um, considered delayed in the sense of qualifying for a developmental delay, we look at cognitive, we look at motor, we look at several different areas, but we don't look at academics, it is important for us to know that a, a school-age student may be struggling enough academically to where developmental delay may not be the most appropriate category. So sometimes it can help to gather some information in this, in this area as well for DD. Um, you can always add things to a permission form. You just can't remove something that is required and the system won't let you remove, um, at least for initials, it won't let you remove an area that is required by law. Also know that sometimes we get students who come to us with um, an outside evaluation that is current. We have a lot of good data that comes to us from outside sources. So even though for an initial evaluation all of those areas are checked, you may already have that data in existence from an outside evaluation. And if so, we, we have the data and we can include a summary of that information in our reports in order to satisfy that that information has been gathered and been considered. Um, it's very important though that you've got some internal procedures um, and, and some guidelines about how current does that data need to be. Do we need to, to um, have some internal data that is consistent with that? For example, if we have adaptive behavior ratings from an outside source that are current, you know, three to six months maybe, um, and we look at the results and don't feel like that's the same behaviors that we see at school, then we're probably going to want to give our own assessment to supplement that and to have a comparison. So again, you probably will have internal procedures that help you make those decisions and make sure that you follow your local guidelines on that. Um, this resource and all of the other resources that we've mentioned in, throughout this series can be found on the Educational Diagnostician Padlet at this address. And this is open for any of you to see and use. And I would also invite you, if you have resources that you feel like are appropriate, things that you use in your district that other diagnosticians may benefit from, if you could send them directly to me and my email will be at the end of this presentation, um, then I can add them to the Padlet so that they can be shared with everyone. So as we determine, as the professional, what we're gonna use for our tools, First, I wanna say that I, I fully recognize that you're also working with the tools that you have. So some of you are in districts where you could choose from a variety of tools. You go to the testing room where the materials are kept and you can pick one of you know, four different IQ tests or you may have a lot of things in your arsenal. Um, you may be able to choose from the Woodcock Johnson or the Wyatt or the KTEA for your academic tool. Um, but some of you may only have limited tools. So we've kind of got to balance that reality of this is what we have, so this is, this is what we have to choose from, and thinking about is it appropriate. And there are times when even in a district where you don't have the tool, you may be able to strike a deal and borrow a tool from a neighboring district in, in those rare situations where you say, you know, what I have is, is just not gonna work. It's not appropriate for this kid or it's not gonna tell me what I need. Um, so in those cases, I would encourage you to reach out within your networks of, of people to say, 
can I can I get this on loan? Um, or you may reach out to your director and say, I really think we need to add this tool. I think we need to add this to our ordering list um, in order to really do what's right for students. As you choose that base tool that you're going to use, no matter what area we are assessing, we need to think of a, a couple of different things about the student. Um, and so we have to know these things in advance before we can pick the tool. We have to know the age of the student, obviously. Some of our tests do only go down to a certain age. Others uh, stop being used at a certain age. Um, so it's important that we know the age of the student as well as the age range that the test actually covers. It may be important to know about the student's suspected or known developmental level as well because some of our students who may be eight years old and a test is appropriate for an eight-year-old, if we already know or think that they are much, much lower than that um, developmentally, or we suspect that their cognitive level is much lower than that, we may need to choose a different tool. Sometimes that's just because the test only goes so low. Um, other times it's because of developmental level we may need to to choose a test that tends to be more engaging or interactive. Um, if, if I know that a student has particular problems uh, with motor skills, with vision, with hearing, that's going to affect um, how to choose a tool as well. Knowing about the student's cultural background and language background is important as well. Um, we know with our students who come from uh, a primary language other than English, if their English is not yet proficient and they are proficient in another language, we, we need to assess them in that other language if at all possible. Um, so we have to know more about that. We have to ask those questions right in the beginning. Um, we also know that some of our tests tend to have a lot of cultural information um, that just doesn't click with some of our students. Um, and I, I'll just give you one example from my past um, when I lived and worked in North Carolina um, and an older version of a cognitive test there was um, a picture arrangement subtest and it included um, a series of a kid fishing and it, there's a lot more to it but the, the student had to actually know a little bit about the process, how fishing works, in order to complete the task, in order to know what the, the logical series would be. And I had lots of kids who had never experienced fishing, didn't know how it all worked, and these tended to be students from uh, a different minority background, and really the test just did not seem fair. There was so much cultural exposure that was needed in order to do well on that particular item. And there were other items like that as well. Um, so knowing about the test and what kind of items it asks and whether or not it has uh, a heavy cultural, um, cultural kinds of questions or heavily linguistic based questions is important in choosing the tool. We want to make sure that we have those base tools that give us that bird's eye view. We have to be able to branch out as far as we need to in order to identify areas that we could be concerned about. Um, and we're, we're going to know if there's a specific kind of um, academic or other concern from our referral data but we don't focus just on that area. We need a, a nice snapshot of what's going on and a lot of our base tools will give us the opportunity if we need it to give um, additional assessments, additional subtests that give us that broad scope of things. So think about as well if we already have adequate data if you already have data to suggest that there are no academic problems, and maybe this is a student that we have very strong functional concerns, but we don't have academic concerns, 
We're going to know that by the data we already have. So we may have current classroom performance. We may have NWEA data. Um, we may have iLearn or old ISTEP data that shows that the student is doing well. A progress monitoring data from um, the intervention process. If all of that looks good, there really isn't anything that requires you to give an academic assessment on top of that. Now again, go back to your district policy or your co-op policy. There may be guidance that says we give a battery, a standardized battery. Um, but check with, your, check with your local procedures on that. So some of the most common base achievement tools that are used, um, there, there definitely are others, and, and I heard from our cohort online that um, people are using different things as kind of their standard measure. But I would say that most districts in the state are using the Woodcock-Johnson Test of Achievement, um, the Wexler Individual Achievement Test, or the Kaufman Test of Educational Achievement. And I listed the most current versions here, um, but know that those change over time. And it is important to change as the test changes. When we get a new version of a test out, there is some grace time to be able to use up your, your existing protocols and not have to waste a lot of money as a district, which is important that we're being fiscally responsible. Um, but that only goes on for so long before we really need to break down and buy that new test kit. That's sometimes really hard for a district, and that's sometimes really hard for you all when you maybe don't have a current version and you feel like it's been too long and it's time to use something else. And I think that that really leaves us in an ethical bind of saying, I'm, I don't feel like this is current enough anymore. So again, advocating to your, your district that it's time to, to bite the bullet and buy the new test. Um, that, that piece is important in order for us to have data that we feel like that if we're ever called into court, we can feel like we did what was right, we did what was important, and we're using valid information. So we think about the areas that might be needed, and with our academic achievement tests, we kind of get that broad sense of how is the student doing in reading. Um, we can look at math, we can look at writing, and we can look at language with the oral expression, listening comprehension pieces. We need to think about, is somebody else from the multidisciplinary team already digging into that area? So for example, if um, if the student is already being assessed by the speech language pathologist to look at language, then there may not be any reason for the diagnostician or the psychologist or whoever is completing an achievement test to do language portions of that test. If there are no language concerns, there's really not a concern, um, then we, we wouldn't want to give those portions of the test. We're digging into the things that we are, have questions about. So if I, know, if I am absolutely solid in my belief that this student is high achieving in reading, I really don't need a test to prove that as long as I have other data that supports that. So I may dig deeper into a concern area of math. And then if writing, if I'm not really sure, then I definitely want to assess it so that we, we will know is, is there um, any kind of concern there or not? So again, think about who else is doing what, and that piece is um, just a, a coordination piece for us to know who's gonna test the different areas, who's gonna be looking at that data so that we don't over-test something and we don't miss something. Everything has to be covered that we wanna look at, um, but we wanna make sure that we aren't using up the student's time or our time with unnecessary tests. Some of the other base tools that are out there that are not in the academic realm, um, again, are tests that give us that broad scope, that bird's eye view of give me the big picture in this area. So some of our behavior rating scales that look at multiple areas, um, such as the BASC or the Connors, um, or the Beck Youth Inventories, 
will give us multiple areas um, of feedback. So it may look at depression, it may look at anxiety, it may look at um, oppositional behavior, but it's giving us not just a heavy focus in one area, but a lot of areas that may send up a red flag saying, look at this one further. Give me some more on, on this particular one. We also have um, broader kinds of adaptive behavior assessments, um, such as the ABOS or the Vineland. Again, they're, I'm not endorsing these tests. There are definitely others out there um, that can be used. Um, but they give us adapt functional and adaptive behavior in multiple areas, not just in one very specific area. And then many of you, as part of evaluations, could be providing some transition information, doing some transition assessments. That can be very helpful for especially initial evaluations of students who are in um, middle school or high school, that this may be their first assessment, but they're also of transition age. It can be very, very helpful to the teachers of record um, to have that transition assessment information ahead of time. Um, but if you look at a general kind of checklist, it may give you some information about career, some information about training, it may give you some information about um, life skills, but not digging too deep into any one area. As we look at the data that we get from our base assessments, and those really should be done first, because they tell us where do we need to go next? What do we need to do with this data? Um, we want to assess first, does the assessment data that we've collected, does it align with the data that we already have? And it's, you know, it's easy when we get assessment data and we say, yep, that's exactly what you thought was, was going to come out of this data. And we come to our meetings and say, you know, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know because um, you guys suspected this, right? doesn't always work that way. It's kind of nice when it happens, but um, it, it definitely doesn't happen that way all the time. In fact, a lot of times we assess a student and it does not match at all what, um, what the classroom data is showing. Then it's our job to figure out why. And sometimes we have to dig deeper into areas to try and answer that question of, why was it different when the student was with me? Is it something environmental? Is it something um, related to relationship with staff? Um, is it motivation? You know, what, what is the key there? So does the data confirm or contradict what we already knew or what we thought we knew at least? Um, does the data point us in the direction of looking at something else? Does it tell us that we ought to give another test? Does it tell us that we maybe should um, do another interview or um, gather some additional records or something like that? Do we need to dig deeper to establish eligibility or do we need to dig deeper to inform the IEP? So again, I know I've said this a number of times in this series, it's really important that when we do our part as far as the evaluation, that we not only end up with a report that, that points us to whether or not the student is eligible based on the results, but it's the now what. Now what do I do with this student? What can you tell me about how I should maybe teach them? What kind of services might be appropriate? What might be likely to work? And sometimes we have to gather additional data in order to answer those kinds of questions and provide appropriate recommendations um, for the now what. So if we dig deeper and choosing that um, follow-up tool and trying to come up with something that's going to answer those questions, um, again, first, do we need one? Um, there are some states that require follow-up tools. Uh, I've worked in states before where if you got one set of data, you had to, in any of the areas that showed a low score, you had to give a second similar subtest in order to confirm that data. Um, I would encourage you to um, always look at your data and see whether, whether it matches with the other data that you have, 
but that you're not necessarily required to have a, a second test to confirm something. Um, again, go back to your local policy on that because your, your directors may require something more stringent. Um, if you decide that yes, you do need to give some additional tests, well, what's the reason? Is it for some diagnostic information? Is it to go um, more in depth in an area that seemed to be problematic? Um, or is it because we need to um, figure out why the data doesn't align with, with classroom performance or um, state testing performance or um, behavior that we see typically in the classroom? So when things don't match up, we need to figure out the why. Some of the follow-up tools, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but some of the things that we tend to use as an after we've given a base tool, um, the, the CTOP, the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, um, to look at phonemic awareness and, and phonological processing. Um, sometimes we'll use something like the key math because a lot of our, our base tools for academic achievement, they do give us some opportunity to go beyond just calculation and math reasoning. A lot of them will have maybe a math fluency test. Um, but something like the key math might dig into, is it very specific? For some kids, it's a calculation problem in general. For other kids, it's strictly multiplication. Everything else is good, but this particular area is, is causing me grief. So some of those tests will help us figure out if there are maybe gaps um, that could be filled that may not be disability related, but just may be a, a gap in learning um, that we need to address maybe through some additional support or intervention. Um, for a lot of us, um, the, the BERI VMI is used to assess visual motor integration. And the follow-up pieces to that are to use just the, the visual processing or the motor coordination pieces to dig deeper into, is it my visual motor integration as a whole or is it a very specific kind of process that I'm struggling with? Um, so again, looking using some of those very specific subtests on achievement tests. And sometimes that is after we've scored what we've done first. So, for example, a, a high school student, if I test and I use word reading and I use reading comprehension, but I can see that something's not quite right and I need to go back and, and gather more information about reading fluency, phonemic awareness, um, decoding skills, then I may give some additional subtests from those base tools in order to gather that information as well. Um, and you also may dig into things like more specific transition assessment. Um, using a, a, a more in-depth um, self-care skills checklist or something like that, that that goes deeper into an area of transition as opposed to that, that broad scope. So as we think about some of the contradictions in data that we get, sometimes the differences that we see are across sources. So it could be from teacher to teacher, from a rating scale and an observation, from parent to teacher. Um, we may just see some big differences. Now I think a lot of the time we see more commonalities than we do differences. So we're able to talk about those in our report that you know, we see this at home and we see this at school and that's very similar. But it is important to talk about those differences as well. Now when two um, pieces of data are just drastically different, now we've got to do something with this. We've got to figure out why is it because of the rater? Is it because of the rating, um, rating scale or the source of data that we, we used? Um, or are there just differences that we can explain in other ways? So we may look at things like, um, are we seeing differences because of um, the particular location, class, time of day, day of the week? We have some students that if you test them on a Monday and you test them on a Thursday, you're going to get different results. 
some of our kids come in on Mondays and they are not themselves because maybe they've had a lot of uh, upheaval during the weekend and they're bouncing from one house to another. I mean, those kinds of things can sometimes explain um, differences. And if you ask the teacher in advance, they can usually identify some of those patterns that, oh, you don't want to test this kid on a Monday. Um, so think about those kinds of things, um, both before you gather the data, but then when you do see the differences, look for when, when did this piece of information come out? When did another piece of information come out? We may also see differences across similar measures. Some of you may give, um, give an IQ test and and see something that um, you are concerned about, but then have that area of processing be tested with something else that's showing that there, there really doesn't seem to be a problem. Or the same thing with an academic assessment. You may have reading fluency that was really low on one test, and you give another reading fluency measure that's similar, and they did well. So again, we kind of defer back to, well, let's look at time of day, let's look at it was one day with glasses and one without. Was one day with medication and one without. That can make a difference as well. Um, so again, we've got to try our best to explain those contradictions in data. So as we use that concept of triangulation of data, what that's, what that's talking about is um, looking at our variety of data sources in order to to really have a, a firm understanding of what the data means and feel confident in the data. So we always have data that com comes to us before the evaluation starts. That's what brought us to the point of um, requesting a multidisciplinary evaluation. So we have the pre-data, we have the data that we collect purposefully during the evaluation, and then a lot of times we may have additional data um, that's almost unintentional but can be very helpful. So for example, if you have a student that we know some, um, some data about the student's functional and adaptive behavior coming into the evaluation, there may be specific concerns. Then we have rating scales typically that we fill out. So we have home rating scales, we have parent rating, or home rating scales and school rating scales, and we have um, a comparison there as well. But even sometimes um, our results from those rating scales don't match with what we happen to see as we work with students, as we observe them in the classroom. And it, we have lots of data that suggests that um, maybe that information was correct. Um, I have sometimes when, when I have rating scales that are incredibly low, that, oh, this kid self-direction is super low and they can't seem to keep organized or um, take care of themselves, but yet this kid shows up to school every day on time and is holding an after-school job and has had that job for a year and has been consistent and not gotten fired and maintains their own car insurance. And, you know. Those, those pieces of data are important as well. So we gather all that and try to make sense of what is the most, um, the most logical outcome for this data. Um, what can we really feel confident in saying, I, really, I think this is a good source of data. So the, the law is very clear in saying we never use just one piece of information in order to make a decision which is part of why we do that broad evaluation. We have a multidisciplinary team and not just a team of one, and that we're gathering information from different sources and in different situations. So when in doubt, when, you know, sometimes we get a second piece of information and it's not quite in alignment, and then we get a third piece of information and it kind of shores it up to say, okay, I, I feel comfortable with this. Um, but when things are, are too far apart, you dig into it a little more. That's when you use some more follow-up tools. That's when you um, get one more rating scale completed. Go back and do one more observation, whatever it takes to just make it clearer. And then you write it up and you try to explain it.
So it is important to note those times when things are in contrast in the data. You write those in your report. Just be transparent about them. This, you know, we saw this behavior at home and this at school. And sometimes that is accurate. Sometimes we have a very different kid with a different skill set that they're using in different locations. Um, and, and that is okay as long as it's valid. If it's not valid, then we need to have a good explanation. The rating scale was, uh, you know, sometimes our, our parents don't read and we don't know that. Um, so we may have um, some confusion. Um, when things just really don't jive with what you have seen, then it's, it's good to follow up on those. Make a call home to say, you know, I, can I ask you a little bit more about some of these things that you rated? Because sometimes we'll find that the parent didn't understand the rating scale or the teacher didn't understand the rating scale. Our rating scales are not are not that easy to complete sometimes and people um, may think that they need to say yes or no to an item um, based on the wrong guidance I guess. So it is important to dig into that, to figure it out as best you can, and to be very transparent and write it up in your report to account for it. So thank you so much for continuing to be part of this series. Um, we hope you know a little bit more about how to choose those assessment tools and that you'll be part of um, more of these discussions in the future. Um, and you can check out our additional resources and our upcoming trainings on the Indiana IEP website.